Well, welcome to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast, where we talk about all things thyroid. Uh, and we love on this show to focus on positive and practical help. That's all about living a thyroid friendly lifestyle. And today we're talking about hair, which is great because it's, we all have it, uh, or most of us have it. <laughs> some of us have lots of it. Some of us have less. Some are losing it. Some it's dry. Some it's brittle. And that is what we're really going to talk about is the connection between thyroid and hair, uh, because it really can be a problem and it can be a symptom that something's not going uh, right with your thyroid. And to, to talk all about hair with me, I am joined by Laura Seigen, who is the founder of thehairfuel.com, she, which is a portal all about hair growth and hair health. And she takes a really holistic approach to hair health, which I really love as well. She's developed the the hair fuel growth mask. And we're going to hear a bit about that uh, later in the show as well. So welcome, Laura, all the way from Amsterdam. I've never had a European guest on the show before. So you're very special and very welcome. So welcome to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. Thank you so much, Annabelle, for such warm welcome. And, uh, you know, no pressure for being the first European guest. Hopefully I will represent. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to, to talk about our topics today. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, hair... Like, I think when you know we first connected, I'm like, I don't know, I don't really have much hair. <laughs> My hair's short, <laughs> and um, and now I have healthy hair. But if I look, you know, back and for people that might have um, seen some of my things online or my book or whatever, I put photos from way back when I was first diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which was in 1996. Um, and at that point, my hair really was not falling out in clumps like some people's do, but it was definitely mm -hmm. thinning. It was very dry, very brittle, frizzy hair. And so I know that then, you know, I was having thyroid related hair issues back then. And I mean, my thyroid health is in a very different place now to when it was then. But I think it is common, isn't it, to have um, problems with hair with thyroid problems. Is that something you see a bit of, Laura? Oh, absolutely. Um, there is a direct uh, link between the thyroid hormones, so T3 and T4, that affect uh, the production of your hair cells that then manufacture your hair. So no wonder that people suffering from thyroid issues they actually either they notice their hair health deteriorating first and then they start finally taking care of themselves and then doing the blood checks and blood panels or and then they in that process they discover that they have underactive or overactive thyroid or, or any you know Hashimoto's like in your case um, or they have the diagnosis based on the fatigue or whatever the other symptoms of thyroid um, dysfunction is and then later on uh, they notice that their hair health is changing or it is well, mm. it's becoming more in line with the symptoms, which is dry and brittle hair or hair falling out in clumps as well. So the link is very, very close, especially mm. I, want to, I think we're going to dive into that topic a bit later on in women specifically, um, and especially those kind of entering the perimenopausal period as well. So the link is very, very strong. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, quality of our hair, I mean, it sounds sort of vain, doesn't it, to think that it should matter so much, but it really does matter. You know, I think for women, well, and for men, you know, men have different probably hair and self-image, um, maybe different beards. issues. <laughs> <That's not laughs> that bits. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> But, you know, I think like you've got beautiful, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you know, Laura's got beautiful long hair. Like, you know, I used to have long hair. It wasn't really beautiful, not for a long time because of my thyroid health. And, and you know, I think it, it, the way we, the way we look has a, has an impact on how we see ourselves and, and hair can play a really big role in that. So having healthy hair, it, yeah, it sort of sounds like, it shouldn't matter as much as it does, but it really does matter, doesn't it? Oh, it does. 
It absolutely does matter. And actually, they there have um, there has been a research conducted um, by Yale University that actually measured people um, according to their self perception of how their hair looked like. I want to remind you of a couple of things. One, I have a new website, which is called Let's Talk Thyroid.com. So that is the easiest place to go find all things Let's Talk Thyroid, book, podcast, thyroid box, kickstart program, and strategy session, all available through there. Number two, it is Christmas coming up, so you might want to start to think about any thyroid friends in your circle that you might like to buy a book for or uh, a thyroid box, or if it's maybe you, you might want to start to think about whether you'd like to, you know, try the Kickstart program, perhaps even in the lead up to Christmas or definitely in January, February, start to think about those options. And the third thing is if you listen to this podcast and get some benefit from it, I would love to ask a favor. Can you share it with a friend? Can you interact with me on social media? Hit the like buttons, maybe comment on some of my posts. It really helps. The social media algorithms are just horrible at the moment, uh, particularly for anything health related. So if you can um, yeah, just hit the like button or add a comment, uh, ask a question. Does, it's just that interaction and it's just so helpful because I know, for example, even in my Let's Talk Thyroid community, the Facebook group, there's well over 1,100 people in the group and be rarely, most posts rarely reach like a couple of hundred. And so I know that's because social media doesn't really like health-oriented information. Uh, they think that I don't know what they think, but it really is hard. You can't really advertise on social media easily. Uh, so those little interactions, the likes, the comments make a massive, massive difference. So if you could do that, really appreciate it. Of course, a, an iTunes podcast review is super helpful. All of those feedback to let other people and the algorithms to know that this information is helpful to you and probably then to other people goes further than you realize and i would be ever so grateful versus their performance in test so actually oh. the perception of how our hair looks like affect our cognitive function so this there's been wow. actually two papers written i know it's a, you know, a, a well-known institution so it's a mm. it's, it's a thing it's not something that is in our head and then also when something is in your head it doesn't mean that it's not real if it affects how you mm. feel, it's real enough. And yes, absolutely. I hear what you're saying in terms of like, oh, hair is so vain. Um, you know, why caring for your hair maybe may come across as vain. But really, it's an inherent part of us. So mm. why do we care how our clothes look like? How do, you know, how our skin looks like? But hair is like, no. It also from... From the evolutionary perspective, if our hair looks healthy, it means that we're signaling to the outer world that we are healthy, that our health is on point. And therefore, mm. you know, from from the evolutionary standpoint, that also played a role. So it's combined, combining all of that. Plus, also, I think a lot of uh, a lot of your listeners can relate to the feeling that they have when they come out from a hair salon after a good haircut or blow dry. I mean, you feel invincible. It's like, wow, I, <laughs> I know amazing. it's amazing. Isn't it? I went to the hairdresser yesterday. You can see I've got completely bleached. <laughs> so you're probably like, don't bleach your hair. I'm completely bleached. Um, and, but you're right. Uh, you do, you feel it's, it's amazing what that does for your confidence. And so I think that it is important and in this context, if you're listening and you're not happy with how your hair looks, keep listening because we're going to dive. I'm going to get Laura to explain in a minute. Just a bit more about um, well, what what do, what do we need for good hair growth? What you know, what what makes for good, healthy, luscious locks? But if you're not feeling like you know, if you feel like your hair really is suffering, then yeah, keep listening and don't give up because um, yeah, no quick fixes here, I'm afraid. But if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that I'm not. Um, a big advocate for quick fixes. Anything, anyway, everything with thyroid happens slow, and hair doesn't grow super fast. So we're we're in it for the long haul, aren't we, <laughs> Laura? Um, yes. Let, let's start off. Let's just go back to really the basics because 
I mean, what, what do we need for good hair growth? Like what are the, what are the ingredients, you know, that our body needs so that we do have good, healthy, you know, good, healthy hair? Well, uh, I, I so resonate with the ethos that you just shared that no quick fixes because unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends which side of the fence that you're on. Um, you need healthy body to grow healthy hair, a body that is in balance, a body that is stressed, a body that isn't being fed by fresh, uh, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, um, good amount of proteins and fat. It's just, it's impossible to grow healthy hair. Yes, maybe you have come across some outliers, your friend who just eats Big Macs and um, doesn't have very good health and then they seem to have amazing, gorgeous hair. That's an outlier. That is an outlier and people shouldn't be measuring themselves against it. It is very much that if you look at, if you look um your body internally it is only a healthy body that can grow healthy hair no quick fixes so one main ingredient have a good balanced lifestyle and that means you need to keep up your exercise routine you need because exercise helps uphold a healthy immune system something that is a big area of attention that as i know for uh, a lot of people suffering from thyroid dysfunction so Exercise is absolutely should be on the top list of your priority. It also helps alleviate symptoms of high stress. So if someone is stressed, exercise does certain types of exercise helps alleviate stress. Um, and stress plays a huge role in hair loss. A stress related hair loss is one of the biggest contributors to um, hair loss amongst women. So mm. that is stress is one big topic that we can, I think we can do another. I know stress is a massive topic. <laughs> Everything in this podcast, every conversation, stress is there somewhere, you know? So exactly. yeah, you sort of forget that. Yeah. Like if you go through a really stressful event, you can, that really can impact your hair, can't it? Irrespective yeah. of thyroid health. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. And then one key thing that is super important to hair growth is blood flow. Because believe it or not, so we have about 90 to 100,000 hair follicles on average, give or take, people, people have um, d different, but that's, that's how many we have, 90, 90,000 hair follicles that each own wow. our scalp. And each of them has a tiny blood vessel attached to it, something that is absolutely mind-boggling. But yes, every wow. hair on your scalp has a tiny blood vessel attached to it. And through the blood vessel, is how your hair receives nutrition. So if there is not sufficient blood flow to scalp, your hair wouldn't grow, or it would grow slowly. You just wouldn't get enough nutrition to grow. So blood flow is the number one thing when it comes to, to hair growth. So focusing uh -huh. on that topically. So I would say number one, and I just said all about exercise and balanced nutrition, but here's the thing, you can be eating really healthily and taking all the supplements, but then for whatever reason, your scalp might be just not getting the message and with a reduced blood flow to your scalp, you may not be able to grow healthy hair. So that can also happen. So something to bear in mind. Mm. Well, there's, a, there's a, another thyroid connection, isn't it? Because, you know, blood circulation, well, from an underactive thyroid perspective, uh, everything slows down, including circulation, which is why we can end up with cold fingers and toes and noses and, um, and you know, I, the body is concentrating its um, blood flow to your central organs. And so I suppose that includes, you know, hair's not necessary for life, you know, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So if that blood flow, 90,000, that's incredible. <laughs> that's amazing. That makes that's body is a miracle. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that makes sense then if there's, um, yeah, if your thyroid function is low, just from a blood flow perspective, that will be impacting on thyroid health too. Are there particular sort of nutrients or, um, you know, vitamins, minerals, that sort of category like th that we need for good hair growth? I would say um, magnesium. So apart from your A to Z um, that you hopefully either getting from supplementation, just A to Z vitamins, 
um, or balanced nutrition, which is even better, but maybe a little bit more stressful because then every meal becomes this math exercise. Do I have enough this vitamin and that vitamin? But one of the um, supplements that we advise people to look at is magnesium because it actually strengthens, supports uh, nervous system. So if you are going through mm -hmm. a period of stress, I know it's it's not directly uh, it's not a direct link, but if your body is going through a period of stress, it doesn't think as the, as you said about our hair growth as a life supporting function. So it just gives up on that. Or what even worse, what might happen is that our body starts robbing hair follicles of magnesium that they have um, during periods of stress. So magnesium is an important like magnesium citrate. It's available in many pharmacies, in all pharmacies, I think. I've never gone to a pharmacy to like a, a drugstore yeah, and not. It's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Even the supermarket. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's easy. Just go get it. Um, so that is, uh, that's an important one to look at, especially if you're like majority of us, I think, um, if your listeners are prone to stressful environments, so magnesium. Another thing is iron. So this is something to be really quite careful about because, and that also applies to magnesium and other supplementation is to understand what is the deficiency there. So, which is why we strongly recommend people when they come to us with the, you know, like, oh, my hair just started falling out in clumps. What should I do? Does your product help? Well, do you know why your hair starts falling in clumps? Do you know maybe you have a thyroid issue and you need to understand your body individual deficiency? And having said that, as I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you've uh, shared a lot more on, on the topic is low iron because the absorption of iron gets impeded during if you're suffering from hypothyroidism and iron is you know is key to hair growth because it well it carries uh, oxygen to throughout your body so it plays a huge role in that um, so iron is also something to be mindful about. And actually people with thyroid issues are all, they're, they're frequently also diagnosed with anemia as well. So something to, to bear in mind. Um, mm. and then another one is, uh, getting your omega threes. So whether you're getting it from animal sources like fish oil or, uh, cod liver oil, um, or you can get it from linseed or flaxseed in some, in some countries, it's known differently. Um, that's also a good one because it, again, it strengthens your immune system, your immune response and your nervous system as well. So your body can actually focus on the thing that you want to focus on, which is, hair growth and healthy hair. So definitely those, so A to Z, uh, magnesium, omega-3 iron, if you're deficient. So understand your individual deficiencies as well, and then start managing your hair growth from that perspective. Okay. So you said A to Z. What I don't understand what that means. What A to Z. A vitamin <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a vitamin A to vitamin Z to zinc. So from vitamin A to Z. Oh, uh, all of like them. A all of them. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm old. Yeah. And, no, it, and some of that's a cultural thing. Like we would just say a multivitamin, but yeah, so all of the vitamins from, from A to Z, I'm with you now. Okay. That's all right. Just I thought, well, sometimes I've, I've learned if I don't ask uh, the obvious or maybe the less obvious questions and someone will be thinking, what? what? Oh, Annabelle didn't ask that question. What, what did she mean? <laughs> so, well, did you ask? I yeah. wanted to leave your listeners confused. Yes, a multivitamin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And is there a difference, Laura, like if if you've got a, you know, your hypothyroid to hyperthyroid, is there a difference in impact in in hair? Yes. So the way that... Um, uh, that the, your thyroid affects your hormones and hypothyroidism versus hyper, uh, hyperactive thyroid is vastly different. They're like diametrically opposite. Um, mm. First, so if we're to look to underactive thyroid or a lot of people suffer from Hashimoto's as well, so that's obviously applicable to them, is that there isn't enough or T3 and T4 hormones that are being produced in your body. And then T4 is actually directly responsible, like I said at the beginning of the episode, is directly responsible for manufacturing keratinocytes. And keratinocytes are specific cells that then manufacture keratin tissue that then becomes your hair in your hair follicles. So if there isn't enough uh, T4 hormone in your body, 
then you just don't have enough raw material to manufacture the hair. So you're, the, those cells are not getting produced. Mm. And then T3 and both T3 and T4 hormones, they're playing another role in slowing down apoptosis, which is a, a death of keratinocytes. So their role is all almost many roles that they play in human body is to slow down the death of a hair follicle cell. So if there isn't enough of those hormones, it means that the cells in your hair follicles are dying sooner. So hence the hair loss ah, that okay. hands, hmm. which is also another reason why these two factors is why people suffering from underactive thyroid they start experiencing brittle hair they start thin experiencing thinning hair or hair loss so this is how underactive thyroid affects our hair growth when it comes to overactive thyroid it's they actually, and maybe it's, um, it's unfortunate that the link is still being looked at. It isn't as direct because it could be a combination of factors. The current hypothesis is actually something to do with immune response. So it's, again, your immune system is distracted from growing and healthy hair. That is one thing. There are also immune cells that are located in your scalp around your hair follicles that are present and they're necessary to instill a hair, a healthy hair growth cycle. And if your immune system is overactive, overreactive, and it's busy in fighting your own thyroid, um, it just doesn't pay attention to hair growth. In addition, people with overactive thyroid, they may be on medication that are supposed that is supposed that aims to reduce uh, amount of thyroid hormones in your body, and then as a side effect um, to that, you may experience hair loss and hair thinning. And by no means, don't stop taking the medication just because you're experiencing hair loss. This is isn't what it is about. It's just hair health is something that. We invite people to learn how to manage and get curious about their hair growth. It isn't about, no, absolutely, you need to always be treating the root cause for your hair loss. And then hair loss and hair thing, hair health, it becomes a symptom that you can then manage and people can absolutely manage that. Mm. Yeah, I, f I find it fascinating. I mean, obviously having an underactive thyroid, but I've learned because this is just Let's Talk Thyroid podcast, it's not Let's Talk Hashimoto's podcast, um, I have tried to, over time, really cover some of the hyper graves um, topics as well. Not not as much, and it is harder to find people to talk about that because, A, I guess it's less common. But what I've, one of the things I find fascinating is that we can end up with similar symptoms, but it comes about from completely, you know, from very different um, workings in the body, whether it's hyper or hypo, you know, uh, even things like fatigue, you know, we can, we can both feel fatigued, but from an underactive perspective is you just don't have enough energy and the over, you know, overactive is because you've been giving out so much energy that <laughs> your body's fatigued. So I, yeah, I find it fascinating even with the hair that we can, we can all be losing hair, but the reasoning, you know, might be be different. And so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Does it um, – one of the other things that I, I'm not sure – I didn't really think to ask, you know, give you a heads up on this question, but I'm just going to ask it anyway because you'll probably know. Um, with underactive thyroid, one of the common you know, symptoms is that we lose this outer third of our eyebrows, the hair in the outer third of our eyebrows. Um, as well as obviously can be thinning hair. Is that something, um, yeah, that the eyebrow hair loss? Have you come across that? Eyebrow hair. We do have questions as what can I do to make my eyebrow hair grow, but it isn't something that is that, um, that is like at the forefront of my awareness. Mm, Not nothing yeah, yeah. that, so that's fascinating actually that it comes from the side of your mm. eyebrows. I wonder. I wonder if the hair follicles, you know, if you look at the newborn babies, they're actually, the, the, the hair from their scalp is kind of getting closer to the side of the eyebrow. So I wonder if kind of the mechanism or the, the nature of the hair follicles mm. on the side of your eyebrows are actually closer to, um, to the lanugo hair. So there's the hair kind of the, on newborns. Oh, maybe closer also, to your scalp. Oh, exactly. How fascinating. 
So it's uh, maybe there is something in that. It also in if you look at the kind of your your eyebrows um, on the sides of your eyebrows, it kind of gets to the side of the temples. So some people like me and you can't see it, um, and then people listening to it definitely can't see it. Um, it's uh, it, you kind of have like the sides of your hair that kind of have shorter on the on the side of your temples. So by the, by nature, I wonder if it actually is closer to scalp hair. But this is interesting. I've never come across it. And isn't it quite because we're focusing most, we're focusing on the hair growth and scalp. So this isn't the question mm, that we, yeah, yeah. I don't think we've yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. And look, and I guess in general terms from a, you know, what, when our thyroid health is good, you know, we get back to, you know, if you, if you're underactive, your thyroid is, underperforming is underactive you've like you said before you've got to get to the root well a the root cause as to why that's happening but whilst you're getting to the root cause of why that's happening you also have to be managing your thyroid hormone so whether that is going on you know thyroid medication or not that's a matter for people with their doctors but i know that once once things start to your thyroid hormone levels start to optimize and the diet and lifestyle stuff kicks in and we're reducing inflammation and stress, then, you know, that's, you know, I know generally that's when hair growth will come back, including the outer third of the eyebrows, you know. So again, your, your eyebrow hair is very far from required for, um, you know, for health, <laughs> uh, for survival. survival. So, you know, it is one of, which, which it's just interesting because it really is, a, it's a unique um, symptom that is associated with hypothyroidism. So anyway, there we go. I'd never thought about that being close to the scalp hair though. So that's a really fascinating um, pondering. So yeah, perhaps if you're listening and you know anything about this, feel free to <laughs> comment on one of the social media posts and Laura and I will both learn a bit more about eyebrow hair. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, so Laura, when you, um, I mean, I'm thinking about a couple of people, you know, typical types of people that might be listening, having struggles with their hair. Like, what do you do for, you know, what does the person who, who really is losing their hair in chunks or, you know, like they're losing a lot of hair. It's, it's a significant problem at the moment. Like what would your advice be to, to them, to that person? Like how, what, what, where do they start in terms of regrowing healthy hair? So, to kind of get, uh, put the things that I said about the lifestyle and nutrition aside and also getting your blood checked because this is more like it's a no-brainer. If you start losing hair in chunks for no reason at all, you kind of looked into your, um, in, into your current situation and you are not really stressed or you haven't been stressed, um, this is, this is one like basic thing. Look at your nutrition, look, look, look at your lifestyle, do the blood panel. This is the basics. Let's get them out of the way. Um, but most importantly, it is, so once you start noticing that there is a pattern, it's important to just take a deep breath and not panic because panicking is one of the worst thing that you can do for your hair growth because again, it triggers immune response. It also helps and, and kind of taking, and I'm not saying like take a deep breath just once and it all helps. It's like, no, approach it systematically. You're not alone in this. So whoever is listening, it isn't a solitary problem. There are a lot of uh, women, there's a lot of men for sure, uh, for other reasons, slightly different reasons. Um, but there are a lot of people suffering from hair loss that is just falling out in chunks, especially for women, because we go through this roller coaster, the hormonal roller coaster throughout our lives. I mean, that, mm. I mean, that is intense every month. And then plus you also, when you're approaching perimenopause, that is a whole different story. So it helps to take stock of where you're where you are, you know, how old are you? What is your lifestyle? Also helps to look back in your life for about the period of six months back and understand if you've had a stressful episode in your life within that period, in the 16, three to six months prior. Because you may have gone through, you know, a stressful work project. Maybe you've lost someone you love. Maybe you've, you know, you've, you've recovered from an, from an illness. 
Uh, maybe you've gone through surgery, but you kind of, because you right now you're already on, re on recovery or you kind of forgot about it and everything is fine. It doesn't, it doesn't occur that maybe it's something in the past that kind of trickles down into your present. So that is an important thing to understand, mm. um, to kind of analyze your life a little bit backwards, especially three to six months um, prior, because what what people tend to experience is called telogen effluvium, stress-related hair loss, that actually people start losing hair three months after that stressful episode because of the nature mm. of the hair growth cycle. So those hair that people might be losing in chunks, in chunks right now, um, they have detached themselves from that blood vessel I mentioned earlier three months ago. So right now... Oh, ah, interesting. It's, it's this delayed effect that is frequently mm. observed and people think, oh, I need to change something now. But actually, it's something that's stressful has happened. And right now, they're on the mend. Um, another thing to bear in mind is also if you are on a birth control medication or if you've recently changed birth control for whatever reason, whether you came off, uh, off it or you started a new one, this is something to bear in mind. So... There are a number of things that to understand, to take stock, which is why first invitation is to take a breath, then take many deep breaths, to understand mm. you're not alone and understand what your life is like right now and has been in the last three to six months. It also helps to join a community or speaking to someone about this because one of the most, what happens is that people start experiencing hair loss and it's devastating. I mean, I've experienced that, you know, when I have a hair growth brand, I've experienced when I was losing hair in chunks, well, you know, it's like I can't afford it because how could this be possible? But I knew that three was three to four months before I had an extre extremely stressful episode. Um, so I knew I kind of anticipated as it was unfolding. I was like, okay, three to four months, I know what's going to happen. So it's kind of like it helped me to know and have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And also speaking to people about this really helps because what I would really, I, I really don't want anyone to do is to be alone in this and start panicking because that is worse. And when you start talking to people, whether you're joining communities, whether you're talking to a friend, it just helps to alleviate that feeling of like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going bold, which is for women is such a stigma. Um, and it's, yeah, it can very, it can be very much be panic inducing. So that is kind of the more, more of a holistic advice of what to do. Hmm. And then after this talk, stock has been taken, you might identify that whatever the reason is, um, you start addressing the root cause. And then the next step would be to start thinking about the scalp health. How does your scalp feel? Can you stimulate the blood flow to your scalp, whether it's by doing scalp massages or overnight hair oil, whatever your approach is going to be is to start then thinking about hair health. But first, understand the root cause. Hmm. I think that's really, yeah, really helpful. And, you know, for people that have been listening to, to this show for a little while, it just fits so perfectly in with the approach that I take, because it is that long-term lifestyle approach. And I often say that a lot because a lot of people that listen to this are fairly newly diagnosed because I think when you just being diagnosed with a thyroid problem, you go looking for, you know, information and support and help and, and it can be overwhelming. Um, and so that's often, I, I say something very similar. You're not alone. There is hope. Take a deep breath. You don't have to do everything all at once, but you do have to start taking action. You do have to do something. And so I think, yeah, whether it's, yeah, about your hair or your thyroid or, you know, well, really often it's so, you know, interconnected, the advice is the same. And I, I you know, I really, I love that. In fact, that was one of the things I, I, I liked when I went, um, when, when you connected and I, you know, went looking on your website, I'm like, oh, this is all sort of diet, really, you're talking about diet and lifestyle and taking that long-term approach. This isn't a kind of a, a quick fix. So, um, yeah, I think that's really, really helpful. Uh, Laura, how how fast does hair grow? Like, it, not you know, on average, I guess it's different from different people in different seasons. But like, is there a an average hair growth, or you know, 
Yes, it is about one centimeter or half an inch per month. So that's an average hair okay. growth. Um, something yeah. to bear in mind if, if people are trying to grow their hair out and then they get the trim six to eight weeks is normally advised to basically keep losing that hair length. Uh, whatever you try to grow, you can just cut it off. So if you do try to grow your hair, make sure that you protect the hair that's grown now so you don't have to have frequent trims. Um, but generally it is, yeah, a centimeter or half an inch. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. That's, well, that's probably about, I mean, I think because I've got short hair, I can tell pretty quickly. My hair grows quite quickly. <laughs> it feels <laughs> quick probably because it's short. I'm getting it cut every five weeks. So, <laughs> and I can see, I mean, you can't see now because I really did get it bleached yesterday, but I do get the, then the regrowth. So you can see that that'd probably fit with about uh, how about my hair cycle. I have like a, yeah, a five week hair cycle. Um, so, what, what was so the other thing? Um, that was my, my other. So that the question for the you know that was the hair falling out in chunks. Like that's that's a fairly you're in a fairly desperate position then. And so I really like that advice that that you gave on top of all the other you know tips earlier on. For someone who's you know maybe not losing their hair in big chunks, but they've just noticed the quality of their hair isn't what it used to be. They're um, you know it's dry, it's brittle, maybe it's you know split ends. Um, I mean, is there is it a similar kind of advice or is there something different that you would do at that stage? It is similar and there are also more things that you can do as well, so specifically for the dryness and brittleness. Um, so this kind of uh, looking at your stress levels because it also will affect how your hair is growing out and how it's been, um, how, yeah, how, how it's been behaving. But I would say it's like three S's. Um, so stress, shampoo, and season. Uh, so stress, we already talked about. Season is to understand what season it is that you are in. Season, it means also like the weather season and the kind of your work environment or your home environment. What's your central heating situation is like or AC. So what is the climate that you're living in? Maybe you've moved maybe you moved cities maybe you moved uh, countries there is a different pollution levels that may impact your hair it also helps to so as is season when it i mean it's kind of the environment around you um, what kind of water quality that you're drinking do you drink enough water that's the, that's even a yeah. bigger question do you drink yeah that's water? so easy to be uh, <laughs> dehydrated isn't it yeah for sure yeah yep. Um, so, and also what is the season that is outside? So frequently, well, I live in the Northern Hemisphere, so it's very common to, for me to see the change in my hair health when it comes to autumn, when it comes to winter. And it's oftentimes, it, it, it isn't as much even as temperature because, you know, I wear hats and I braid my hair in, the, in colder climates to protect it. But it's also that mechanical stimulation because your hair is rubbing against the jumper, for example, all the hats that you're wearing, or maybe the central heating indoors that will lead to dry uh, hair and brittle hair. So that's also important to understand. It also um, helps to think about, about your S for shampoo. And that means looking at your products. Have you changed your products recently? What your shampoo contains and your conditioner, of course. Um, and also to understand your hair care rituals in that third S is important. So are you blow drying it? Are you dyeing it? Are you bleaching it? It's kind of really going, is going down and looking at what is it that you're mechanically doing to your hair, whether it comes by the products or hair care techniques. So this is the, if, if you've noticed that and your blood, blood panel is fine, look at these factors and try to understand whether anything has happened in the last, you know, three to six months. And I don't mean right now talking about stress is because it takes our body some time to adapt to new things. And it means the good things, mm -hmm. the positive things that we, that we do is like start drinking lots of water or stopping drinking lots of water and starting to use a different shampoo. So taking that stock and assessing from this three S's. So stress, season and shampoo, to Beresik, I think it's an easy one to remember, um, is a good point to start. Yeah, that's yeah, it's good. It's always helpful when you've got three points. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> easy to remember. And and um, so with the, 
shampoo and hair products. I mean, gosh, that's uh, got to be a multi-billion dollar industry. So <laughs> yes. are, there, are there particular <laughs> things that we should be looking for or really trying to avoid in our hair products? Yes. Uh, these are two things. Is the water soluble, sil- non-water soluble silicons. So dimethicon, it's, um, it's one of the most prominent ones that is frequently in your conditioner or in your hairspray. And this is a silicon that is supposed to kind of coat your hair and make it nice and silky. But the problem is that it needs to be washed out and it isn't easily washed out by water, hence the name non-water soluble silicons. So what it does over time, even though it may give that instant boost and boost and shine and kind of slip in your hair, it effectively suffocates your hair strand and then preventing it from, you know, being wild and free and absorbing all the nutrients that it needs, also including the humidity from surround. We do need humidity. So it kind of has the suffocating effect. So do watch out for non-water soluble silicons. One of the most common one, dimethicone. There, there are a few more, but this is kind of a rule of thumb. I'm sure your listeners can Google that and uh, yep, yep, we can yep, yep. share and know. And then another um, another ingredient to look out for is sulfates and especially harsh sulfates. So SLS right now, I think it's uh, it's becoming more and more common and I think industry reacted relatively quickly to the understanding amongst the consumers that sulfates are really not good for your hair. Health. Mm. It basically stripes, uh, strips your hair off that Ascent that, that oils that your hair needs for that luster and shine because it's too harsh. It's like, imagine washing your hair with a dishwashing liquid. No one wants or like harsh soap. Mm. It isn't something that, mm. that your, our hair likes. And when you strip your hair all those oils, it basically becomes dry and brittle. That's, you know, there's a direct link for that. Because so it's losing less, all the natural oils and. Exactly. It loses the natural moisturization that is actually already Mm -hmm. aligned to your pH. So you don't need to add more hair oil if your hair oil is already, natural hair oil is already balanced. So don't Mm -hmm. strip it in the first place by using harsh uh, harsh sulfates in your shampoo. Yeah. Okay. And um, so tell us a little bit about, I mean, you, you have a whole business around um, hair masks and hair growth and healthy hair, fueling our hair growth. I assume that's why your business is called the hair fuel. Is that right? Is that where it comes yes, from? Yes, precisely. It's like, precisely. It's like putting growth. a yeah. good fuel in the, in the car. If you, if you put the right fuel, it, can, it will go for miles. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's the logic behind it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I like it. It's good. <laughs> so, so what made you go um, develop that your hair, tell us a bit about, you know, what your business is, what, who you help, how you help people, um, you know, what made you get into it. Tell us a little bit about the hair fuel. Well, the hair fuel really was born as a result of my personal struggle with hair, hair growth and hair loss issues. Uh, it started off back when I was 17, I'm now 33. So it's like almost half of my life, 16, sorry. I went to a hairdresser. That, and I wanted to um, have curly hair, so I d- had a perm done, and then that didn't go as well. So I've lost about maybe a quarter. I started losing my hair pretty quickly, and I lost about a quarter of it over time. And what was devastating is that my, my hair just stopped growing. So I didn't like I didn't experience. Sorry, Annabelle, but you disappeared. Oh, did I? I'm still yes. It's okay. Um, I can still hear you. It'll be all right. It's fi- okay. it'll be fine. Yeah, just keep just keep. It's okay. Can I start again? I'll start again. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, okay. so tell us. Yeah, I'll, I'll start again with just the tell. Okay, uh, well, just pause uh-huh. for a sec. Are you? Have you? Can you see me yet? Am I back? Yes, you're back now. And then you. Okay. All right. Back. Okay. That's good. Okay. I think it's fine. Like I think that I don't think there's a problem at this at this end, but that's fine. <laughs> it's a bit disconcerting now. Thank you for letting me know. It's all completely good. So yeah, okay. tell us, Laura, like what made you get, you know, start the hair fuel? Tell us a bit about your story, what led to it, and you know, I want to understand how what you do helps people 
that might be listening that are having problems with their hair. So yeah, tell us the story. Well, uh, the story started when I was uh, quite young is from a trip to a hairdresser when I tried to permanently curl my hair. Uh, you listeners can't see it, but my hair is pretty straight. But I always, you know, always loved curly hair and how voluminous it looks. So I was like, great, you know, I was 16 at the time and I had a perm done. And that wasn't great news for my hair. I lost over time after that about a quarter of it. There's something like approximately that. And mm -hmm. it just wouldn't grow afterwards. So that was like losing hair is one thing. And then it just wouldn't grow. And it's very easy to spot. It was easy to spot because it's like on top of my head, I couldn't see any new hair growing. And I started researching in a lot of different remedies and I tried medications. I've tried horse shampoo. I've tried hot scissors. I've read about trimming hair to grow it. But what a lot of it didn't make sense is that even across the hair growth masks that I, that I bought, it said avoid the lens, uh, avoid the roots and apply it on the lens. And I was like, well, that doesn't make sense because that's not where my hair is growing from. Why is it mm. not talking about scalp? And then I started doing more and more reading and more research and combined with that. So that research kind of started seeing the kind of uh, a th common thread that it's something to do with blood flow. And in parallel to that, I started looking into DIY recipes because of my Slavic roots uh, of my grandma. We had this book, this horticultural book about the plant medicines and how nature oh. has all the answers already. So I kind of grew up with this mindset that nature has everything we need already. So I turned mm. into this DIY beauty and I started researching different recipes and experimented in my kitchen and a lot of, a lot of dirty kitchen cleanups that followed. <laughs> what a mess, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I kind of, I designed the recipe that I knew from the chemical, I'm a, I'm a big nerd, from the chemical, from the chemistry front standpoint, it uh, enters a reaction that stimulates that whole, that causes this effect, this warming effect under your skull. And I could feel it as well, because for me, I love using anything on my body that I could feel, like whether it's tingling, mm. whether it's warming, whether it's cooling, um, I loved it. And then oh, as I was continuing using the, the formulation that I made in my kitchen, I saw, like, I, saw, I felt results and I saw them as well. And then over time, mm. I've been sharing the rest, like the basic recipe with some friends and family and those who weren't lazy enough to do it, they saw results and they're like, that's amazing. My hair is growing like crazy. And then at some point, I was in the period when I was like growing out my hair. I kind of had it like, I cut it short. I had it as short as yours and then it, I had it long. And then I was in the phase of growing it out, but I was a bit lazy and I was like, um, you know, I wish I had it pre-mixed in my cupboard and uh, you know how can I make it happen and I was like but if I have if I figure it out can is it something that other people can also benefit from is it something mm. you know hair growth hair loss everything it's a pretty common problem so that's kind of set off on on the journey that one thought led to another and I was like I, can, I think I can develop it as a, as a product I'm sure it's not going to be that um, that hard. Well, it was <laughs> yeah. because uh, yeah. all, anything all that process, sounds simple <laughs> is not simple. <laughs> yeah. And then also, in addition to that, a theme that's been part of my life since I was 13, actually, is uh, PCOS, so polycystic ovary syndrome. And one mm. of the side effects of that is thinning hair. Um, uh -huh. So this is kind of a condition that I have quite a close relationship with for the last 20 mm -hmm. years of, of my mm. life now. There's and a strong connection between PCOS and Hashimoto's too. It's, yes, indeed. Yeah, they often go together. Not obviously not always, but they can be connected. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's tough. Well, it's estrogen. It's estrogen effects mm. on, on your thyroid and how it, um, it communicates with thyroid binding globally as well. So if your estrogen levels are fluctuating or unstable or low, that definitely has interaction with your thyroid. Yes, it's pretty common. But that's the story. Mm. That's the story of the hair fuel. And then uh, along yeah. the way, I realized that I was doing so much more than just the mask itself. Um, that it then kind of developed more in a framework as well, which is why we're so keen in educating people in those hair health basics. So yes, the mask is one thing, 
And also how to look at your hair health from a holistic standpoint is something that the hairheal.com is, is about. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's was that like I said, when I went looking, it wasn't just buy this product. It's like, there's, the, there's a whole lifestyle that goes along with it. <laughs> um, so, so it, but the product that you sell it is a mask. So it's a product you put on your, on your scalp. Is that, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a supplement that you ingest. It's a, it's an external, um, you put it on, on your hair. That's right. Isn't it? Correct. It is something that you put only on your scalp. So just the roots of your hair, exactly where your hair is growing from. Because supplements, mm. they can be very unique to whatever your deficiency is. And the mask works with whatever shampoo you're using, whatever conditioner you're using, whatever your hair type is, because mm. it works with blood flow. And blood flow works the same amongst all sort of hair types. Every hair follicle has a blood vessel attached to it. So we focus solely on that. Yeah, those ninety thousand <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> just a couple. You just focused on a couple of little things. <laughs> and uh, um, oh, I had another question about it. What, what was it? Um, uh, in like so, in all of you know the the potions and things that you were making up in your kitchen, uh, and I love that you went you know to nature. That you know, um, I, I'm a big fan of plant medicine and. Um, and if we can do things naturally, well, that's got, you know, if we're not putting extra chemicals into our bodies, I'm a big fan for that. So I gather then, you know, the, the hair mask is, it's sort of, they're all, it's all natural product. It's not, you're not adding kind of to toxic chemicals into, no. into your scalp. We yeah. often joke, it's a safe that you can eat it. So actually the manufacturing facility that we use, it needs to be able to handle both the food items and cosmetic items. So that's one, one of the difficulties of setting up the product came through because I wanted to make sure that the product is safe to use even for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh -huh. And it, yeah. it was important for me to, to retain this nature beauty and the power of nature without adding mm. preservatives, without adding any, any other things other than active ingredients that help your hair grow. Mm. And, and have you, maybe it's not, not in the, in this product, but have you come across or have you used essential oils at all? I'm a big essential oil fan. So I'm just curious, is that something you've tried or used or? Yes. Essential I oils? love essential yeah. oils. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan, both from the way that the effects that it has, that they have different effects on our body and also from the sensory perspective, like I'm a mm. big fan of smells, like there's always either an incense burning or there's like an oil lamp and then the effects that essential oils have. Um, but actually, mm. yes, one of the ingredients that we do use is actually peppermint oil, and peppermint oil ah, and okay. rosemary yep. oil. I really, really uh -huh. good ingredients for hair growth. So, but they need mm. to be mixed up with the carrier oil. So that's the thing. It shouldn't be applied in its purest form. It's uh, one to between one to 10 or one to 25, depending on your scalp sensitivity, that you need to dilute it with a carrier oil. And carrier oil could be a sweet almond oil, could be grapeseed, could be olive oil even. Um, but mm -hmm. it's just, that's the proportion. You shouldn't be just pouring your skull with essential yeah oil. yeah don't just get out you you yeah. put it all and <laughs> drip it on your head it might be it might well that that would probably contribute to some of the tingling i would imagine that you mentioned before when you put it on one it's, of the reasons it's quite yeah quite it's quite sorry it's a mosquito bite buzzing past <laughs> my nose um yeah oh good excellent yeah well yeah but peppermint and rosemary like when i've looked into essential oils and hair they're the two that that often tend to come up in um, the recommendations. So yeah, that's, that's good. So Laura, if people wanted to, um, you know, try the hair mask, what's the, what's the best way? Like, how does it work? Like, you know, obviously it works by putting it on your hair and your scalp, but like, is it, um, I mean, and then I'll send people to your website and all of that, but do you want to just, is it a system? Like, is it just a, a one mask you apply once a week, once a day, once a month? How often, like, how does it work? So, the mask needs to be applied once a week. Um, you can go up to twice a week, but no more frequently than that. Once a week is a recommended, is a good starting point. Um, and you get a kit, so hair growth kit. 
And the, the idea is that you get it on a subscription basis because hair growth is, it always happens and we, all, we always need to take care of it. So the subscription model really helps to kind of a reminder is like, hey, you need to take care of your hair because life gets in the way you might forget. Um, but the first month we send a hair growth kit and it comes with everything that you need for the month for, to start the hair growth journey. So it has the shower cap because after you apply the, the mask with the applicator bottle that it will also supply, um, that is really is there so you can apply it only on your roots and on your scalp. Um, then you put on a shower cap. Uh, to trap the heat and we also advise people to wear something warm like a beanie hat and then leave it on 45 up to an, 45 minutes up to an hour and you can go personal favorite is either to do yoga pilates workout at home sometimes i even go for a run looking in my sometimes in summer with a beanie hat and i'm like I don't care. I, I'm going to look great afterwards. <laughs> it's like strangers don't know what to see um, But that is the self-care ritual. This is something that we also talk about a lot, is that it's important to develop this hair care ritual that you look forward to, that you look forward to looking mm. after yourself. So once a week, you know that you're going to spend, you, can, you might do some face masks at, at the same time. You might do your nails, whatever it is that you kind of, dedicate to you that is also an invitation for that moment you use it once a week um, there are different bundles available so people can go on our website thehairkill.com um, we can even uh, that there, there's a special code that, I, that, that that we came up with for the listeners of your podcast if someone's wanting to try it they can do it thyroid 12 that is a code for the listeners if they want to get 12 percent off their first order they're very welcome to um, but the, uh, the different bundles include whether it's a monthly subscription, so you get a box every month, um, and, or you can get a three month bundle or six month bundle. Three month bundle is generally a very good starting point because hair growth takes time. You start seeing the results between six to eight weeks. It's kind of the baby hair on top of your skull. You start noticing the gain in length if you haven't cut your hair. So three month bundle is generally the one that we recommend to start with. Yeah, excellent. And I'll make sure that I put, um, like in the show notes of the description, uh, I will put all the links. So to make it really easy to go check out your website, um, and you know, I'll put that code there too. That's very kind. So thank you very much to, for offering that. Um, and Laura, if people just want to know a little bit more, uh, you know, just follow you for a little while or, you know, connect and learn from you, where, um, uh, where, where do you want me to send people to? So we're pretty active on Instagram. So handle is the hair fuel and uh, they can also subscribe to our hair growth calendar as well. So this is like an education, a short education, well, 42 days long educational journey that we take people on. But generally a more personal connection is possible through Instagram. So they can go there. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I think, um, uh, look, I have learned things uh, t tonight. Uh, in it, it, well, it's night time while we're my night time while we're having this conversation. Uh, and look, I think it, you know the body is so wildly complica complicated, and there's so many different factors. But I think you've done a really good job of sort of really taking it that calm, measured, systematic approach. And uh, I'm looking forward, to, like I do with all my podcast interviews, when I um, I go back and I. I listen as I edit and I, I make notes and that's when I'll, you know, write the show notes and write the social media. And I know there's things that you've said that I thought, Oh, that'll, I'll have to go back and look at that and I'll have to you know, make sure I write that down. <laughs> so I think it's been full of uh, lots of really helpful information. So I want to thank you for your time and thank you for connecting and I'm um, looking forward to, yeah, just staying connected and, I think you've done your region of Europe um, proud tonight, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Annabelle. It's, it's been my pleasure. And, yes, I'm looking forward to staying connected. And, yes, thank you. thanks again and have a, have a good evening. And, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it, it is a, it is, I'm about to start my work, but almost I'm kind of halfway through my work day right now. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that's a pleasure. All right. The information presented and discussed in this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease and should not be used as a substitute for proper advice from a qualified professional.